Hello, my name is Keshwani. That's K E S H W A N I. Keshwani. We are here because we want to prepare for GMAT. We have been solving GMAT math problems out of this book here, the GMAT Official Guide 2022. If you do not own this book already, purchase one immediately. You're going to need it. Always make sure that this book is in front of you when you're working with me. Today we'll solve some problem that you will find on page number 263. Please turn to it. On page 263, you will find some, some data sufficiency problems. We started data sufficiency problems yesterday on day number 11. On the first 10 days, we did, that, uh, we did, we did the problem solving questions. And from yesterday, we began doing the data sufficiency problems. Just give me a second. I'm a little distracted because I lost one of my markers. I have to open another one. So the very first problem that you see there, the very first problem that you see there on page 263 is number 283. Let's take a look at it. Number 283. In number 283 we are told that we have two classes. We are told that we have two classes. A and B. And we are told that each student in class A turns in seven assignments. Each student in class A turns in seven assignments. So seven times A is the number of assignments that was turned in class A. And in class B we are told that each student turns in five assignments. A and B represent the number of students in, in, in the two classes as you understand. What we want to find out is how many students there are in class A. That's the question. Let's see what they give us. In the first one they tell us that the total assignments total number of assignments that were turned in was 85, which means 7 times A plus 5 times B has to equal 85. Obviously from this equation alone we cannot figure out the A. We have two unknown and only one equation. The first statement by itself is not enough. A, D, B, C, E. Since the first statement by itself is not enough, we know the answer cannot be A or D. It would have to be either B, C or E. Second statement tells us that there are 10 students in class B. There are 10 students in class B. Again, by second statement by itself, you can now look at the first statement now. Second statement by itself, simply knowing that there are 10 kids in class B does not enable us to figure out how many there are in class A. Second statement by itself is not enough. When we put them together, of course, we are home free. We know B equals 10. We put it in there, we can figure out the A. The answer is C. In other words, we need information from both statements. Number 284. In number 284 we are told, or rather we are being asked, 284, we are being asked, was the bill for February, was the bill for February greater than January? We have, we have electricity bills for February and January. The question is, do we pay more for February? What we are being told here is this. In first statement, in first statement we are told that the ratio of February to January is 26 to 25. As you can see, that's, that's enough. That's more than enough. A, D, B, C, E. That tells us that for every $25 that we paid in January, we have to pay $26. Is February greater than January? The answer is yes. The first statement by itself is enough, which means the answer cannot be B, C, or E. It would have to be either A or a D. Before we go to the second statement, I want you to understand one thing, that instead of 26 to 25, if, the, if we were given the ratio of 2 to 20, 6 to 25, the answer still would have been, answer, the first statement still would have been enough. The first statement would still have been enough. Because we don't have to, uh, what, what I want you to understand, what I'm trying to make you understand is that we don't have to give the answer in the affirmative. If the ratio had been 6 to 25, now the question is, was the bill in February greater than January? The answer is, no it was not. The answer does not need to be affirmative. All that is required here is that we are able to give a definitive answer Yes, it was. No, it wasn't. As long as we can do that, we have sufficient data. Let's look at second statement. Second statement tells us that the bill for January and February was $183. Now, second statement by itself, knowing that the two bills together were $183, does not enable us to figure out which month was greater. Second statement by itself is not enough, and therefore the answer is A. 285. 
In 285, we are told that we have sequence. We have a sequence of 120 terms. The question is, what is the 105th term in this sequence of 120 terms? Let's see what we are told. In the first statement we are told that the first term is negative 1 or negative 8. Simply knowing that the first term is negative 8 does not in any way, shape or form uh, enable us to figure out what the 105th term is. The first statement is not enough. A, D, B, C, E. Since the first statement is not enough, we know answer cannot be A or D. It will have to be B, C or E. Second statement tells us that each term after the first term, after the first, goes up by 10. I'm not going to write everything there. It says each term after the first term goes up by 10. That by itself is not enough to figure out 105th term. The answer is not B. But when we put them together, we are home free. We know the first term is going to be negative 8. The one after that is going to be 10 more than that. One after that is going to be 10 more than that. 10 more than that. We just keep adding 10 until we get to 105th term and we can figure out what that is. We know the first term. We know the difference. The answer is C. Number 286. So some of these questions are quite straightforward and some we have to do some thinking. For example, next one here, 286. 286 we are told that we have a concrete block. Concrete block where each face is a rectangle. And what we want to find out is the volume of this concrete block. Let's, let's draw the concrete block so we can see what we're dealing with. Each phase is rectangle, so we're dealing with something like this. There we go. We have our length, we have our width, and we have our height. And we, what, what we want to find out is the volume of this thing. Let's see what the first one tells us. First statement tells us. The first statement tells us that each of the each of the lateral phase is 200 square inches. You see what lateral face means? Lateral face means the top and the bottom. There is a top and similarly there is a bottom and those are called lateral faces. Oh sorry, lateral faces are the one that is, the, that's the top and the bottom. Lateral faces are the front, the back, the left and the right. Those are called lateral faces and we are told that the area of each one of those is 200. I'm going to fix this picture a little bit. It looks horrible now that I look at it. I feel better now. So, we have the front, we have the back, we have the left and we have the right and they all have the same same area. Same area, which means this is length, this is height, which means this is also height, length times height, and which is same as this one here, which is height times width, and that is 200 square inches. Let's see what we can get out of it. The well, first thing we get out of it here is uh, we know that it is the, the area of each of these four faces, the front, the back, the left, and the right, is 200. The second thing we get out of it is that because length times height is same as height times width, that in itself also tells us the length must equal width. Because if we just look at this part, if we just look at this part, we can cross out the height, divide both sides by height. So we know length and height are equal to each other. We also know the area of this thing is 200. But we still do not know anything at all about the height. We, and without that, without that, and we also don't know what length and width actually are. We're not, there's not much we can do here. We cannot figure out the volume at this point. The first statement is not enough. A, B, A, D, B, C, E. Let's look at what the second one tells us. Second statement tells us that the top is, top is a square, is a square with the area of 400 square inches. Let's look at the top right here, this guy right here that I drew the first time, which is simply this side right here, which is the width right here, which is the width, and this side right here, which is the length. Length times width, it tells us length times width is equal to 400. Is equal to 400, not only is equal to 400, but we know it's a square. This thing is a square, which means length and width, length and width are equal, and they're both 20. 
So there you go. Now we know the length. Now we know the now we know the length. Now we know the width. But if you look at only a second statement, we know nothing about the height. Second statement by itself is not enough. We need to put them together. When we put them together, now it will get some place. We'll get some place because we know the length times height. This this here. We know the length times height, which we were told. Length times height. Where did you go? Length times height is same as width times height is equal to 200. So if you look at this part, length times height is equal to 200. Let's put it here. Length times height is equal to 200. And we know the length is 20. From second statement, we know that the length is 20. If the length is 20, height must be 10. There we go. Now we know the height, we know the length, we know the width. We can figure out the volume. It's simply 20 times 20 times 10. The answer is C. So as I said before, some questions are quite straightforward and some require some thinking. Number 287. Number 287 we are told that we have R and S, they are working together. They work together to do a certain job, to do a job, to do a job. What we want to find out is how long how long does R take to do the job by himself? I'm not going to write everything. How long does the R take? If you were to ask the R to do the job by himself, how long will it take? Let's see what they tell us. The first element they tell us that S takes three quarter of the time that R takes. In other words, S to R is three to four. S to R is 3 to 4. In other words, if there is some job that S can finish in 3 hours, R will take 4 hours. If it, S can finish in 3 days, this guy's going to take 4 days, and so on and so forth. But that itself does not tell us how long R, to, R will take by himself. The first statement is not enough. A, B, or rather A, D, B, C, E. So A and D are gone. Answer would have to be B, C, or E. Let's look at second statement. Second statement tells us that together they take to, together they take 12 minutes. Again, simply knowing, simply knowing that together they can finish the job in 12 minutes in itself does not tell us how long R will take if you were to ask R to do the job by himself. The answer is not. It should say BCE. I don't know what I'm writing here. It should say BCE. Answer is not B. Let's put them together. As long as, as soon as we put them together, this is where having some knowledge of math comes in handy because they're not asking us to solve the problem. Do you understand? We simply have to, we simply have to be able to tell immediately whether or not we have enough data. And for those of you who are able to see here at this point, that as long as we know the relative speed and as long as we know the total amount of time they take to do, do the job together, that's enough. The answer is C. So from this point on, for the next uh, minute or so, what we're going to do here is for the benefit of those people who are unable to see how to figure it out. I'm going to show you very quickly how to do it. We need the room, so I'm going to do it on the top. Remember, keep in mind that S to R is 3 to 4. So here's the trick. If you want to quickly find out how long it takes them to do it individually, we know together they take 12 hours. So we know in uh, 12 minutes. In 12 minutes, they do one job. That we do know because we are told here. We also know the relative speed is 3 to 4. 3 plus 4 is 7. There are 7 parts in the job. Think of this as 7 parts. One guy does 3 parts, the other guy does 4 parts. Which means, the trick here is that you multiply this thing by 7. If they can do one job in 12 minutes, if you give them the 7, seven times the amount of time, they should be able to do 7 jobs. Out of those 7 jobs, the guy who is faster, the guy who is faster is going to do 4 jobs, the guy who is slower is going to do 3 jobs. And now we can figure out the time that each person takes very quickly. Because we're giving them, we're giving them 12 times 7 minutes. In that 12 times 7 minutes, this guy does 4 jobs. In the same one at a time, 12 times 7, this guy is going to do 3 jobs. There you go. 4 goes into 12 3 times, which means he will take 21 minutes. And this guy will take 28 minutes. As you can see, 21 is ratio is 3 to 4. In other words, 
he can only do it in 21 minutes but this guy also needs a third more time he needs one third more time think of this as seven seven and seven this guy needs seven 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 and seven because he's slower but this was not necessary nobody was asking us how long r will take the question simply was how long does the r take can we figure it out the answer is yes without doing all of this work you understand the answer is c Number 20, uh, that was two, two, 287, was it? Yes. Number 288, in the next column, we are told that Q is positive and V is positive. What we are asking, what we are, what we are being asked is this, which is greater? Which is greater? U raised to V or V raised to U? That is the question we have to be able to answer. As long as we can answer that question, that's what we are looking for. Let's see what they tell us. In the first statement, they tell us that u equals 1. If u equals 1, we have u raised to v versus v raised to u. u is 1, which means u has to be 1, no other choice. It will always be 1. But v can be anything we want. It can be 1, it can be, it can be 2, it can be 3, it can even be fraction. Keep that in mind. All that is required is that it's positive. That's the important part here. It can also be fraction. But u has to be, u has to be 1, which means is 1 raised to 1, 2 raised to 1, 3 raised to 1, half raised to 1. This guy is just 1 raised to 1, 2, 3. It doesn't matter what you put here. This will always be 1. This will always be 1. So, which is greater? This guy or this guy? Well, they are equal here. So that's first scenario. They are equal. I can't really tell which one is greater. They are equal. Here, this guy is smaller than that guy. We can stop right here if you want. You can stop the story right here. Because as you can see, we have two scenarios where Two conflicting answer. In first scenario, I am able to tell you which one is greater, and in one scenario, I cannot. I don't know which one is greater. They're both equal. The story ends. But if you want to continue, you can go one more time. Here, one, and this is half, so one is greater. So they are equal to each other. They are, one is less than the other. One is greater than the other. We can't really tell. The first statement by itself is not enough. A D B C E. The first statement by itself is not enough. In the second statement, they tell us. In the second statement, they tell us that uh, v has to be more than 2. That's the only condition we have to fulfill. v has to be more than 2, and of course, u has to be positive. But other than that, there is no other condition. So just make up something. If v has to be more than 2, here u raised to v, v raised to, v raised to u. Maybe, maybe v is 3 and u is 4. That's possible. Why not? In which case, we'll get here 4 raised to 3. If u is 4 and v is 3, 4 is to 3 versus 3 is to 4, 4 is to 3 is 64, this is 81, 64 is less than that. But there is no reason at all, there is no reason at all why we cannot have something like this. V has to be more than 2, whether 3 or V is 4 now and U is 3. We have just reversed it and of course now we will get just the opposite result. Second statement by itself is also not enough. It is only when we put the two statements together, it's only when we put the two statements together that we're going to get someplace. u raised to v versus v raised to u. Now we know u has to be 1, so it doesn't matter, u is always going to be 1. And the v has to be more than 2, so we can have 2, 3, 4, 5, whatever you like. Oh, it has to be more than 2. It has to be more than 2, I forgot. 3, 4, 5, we can stop right here. But since u is always 1, when, when u is always 1, and v is this, u is always 1, and v is 3, 4, 5, it doesn't matter whether it's 3, or 4, or 5, or 6, or 10,000, because u is 1, this guy is always be 1, this guy, this quantity will always be 1, and this quantity will be always be like 3, 4, 5, whatever it is, it will always be greater, always be greater. Even when we Actually, do you understand? No matter how high we go, it's always be greater. So now we can give the answer, definitive answer. Which one is greater? We can tell that, uh, oh, this is all wrong. One is not greater than three. This is all wrong, cheese. Do you understand? But this is technicality. That doesn't matter. Even if I left it like that, as long as they are all pointing in the same direction, as long as they are all pointing in the same directions, we are done. We are able to give a definitive answer which one is greater. Which one is actually greater than the other, it doesn't matter. Whether A is greater than B or B is greater than A, it makes no difference as long as it is consistent throughout. Do you understand?
Consistent, consistent throughout is redundant. I understand that. I realized that. I just realized it. 289. In 289, they are asking for the range of 30 prices. So apparently we have sold 30 purses in our store uh, and we are told, we are being asked what's the range of these prices. The first statement tells us that one third of these purses were sold for $24 each. Simply knowing that out of, out of those 30 purses that we sold, 10 of them were sold for exactly $24 does not enable us to figure out the range, does it? Of course not. A, D, B, C, E. The answer cannot be A or D. It would have to be either B, C or E. Let's see what the second statement tells us. Second statement tells us that the lowest price, the lowest price was one third of the highest one. In other words, the most expensive purse was sold for three times the amount of the cheapest one. That doesn't tell us what the range is. And even when we put them together, knowing that 10 of those prices were $24 exactly and the uh, most expensive one was sold for three times the price of the lowest one, doesn't tell us what the range is. The answer is E. answer is E because even when we put them together, no can do. That was 289. Let's see what 290 says. In 290, we have three houses. And we are told that they were all sold for different prices, three different prices for three houses. No, no two houses were sold for the same price. Therefore, we have the highest price. This P stands for price. We have the price in the middle house, middle price and the lowest price house. And here's what we want to find out. What we want to find out is this guy. What was the price of the house that was sold for the middle price? Let's see what they tell us. The first statement tells us that the price of the highest house was 130,000 more, 130,000 dollar more than the price of the lowest house. In other words, the difference in the two prices is 130,000 dollars. That does not tell us what the price of the middle house is. A, D, B, C, E. The answer cannot be A or D. Second statement tells us that the price of the highest house, the highest price, was 40,000 dollar more and the house that was sold for the middle price. Again, that by itself does not tell us what that is. The answer is not D. Let's put them together, shall we? When we put them together, we have the price with the highest, highest, highest price, the middle price, and the lowest price. And we know the difference between the lowest price and the highest price is $130,000. So if the lowest price was sold for X dollars, this guy was sold for X plus, two, X plus 130. We also know the price of the highest one and the middle one was $40,000. Highest one was X plus 130, which means this guy, this guy right here was X plus 130 minus 40. In other words, X plus minus 40. Did I write it wrong? Oh, this is $85,000. I wrote it wrong. This is $85,000. As you can see, which is why you don't, you, which, which is why exactly you, sh you, you, sh you don't really actually have to do anything. You just have to understand that we are not going to go anywhere. Exact numbers do not matter. It is a waste of time for me to go and fix the prices. It doesn't matter. This is some price. So what we found here is that the the, the middle price middle price house was sold for forty five thousand dollars more than the lowest price, and the highest price was sold for one hundred thirty thousand dollars than the lowest price. It still does not tell us what the middle price was. How can we figure out the middle price? if we don't know the price of the lowest house? The answer is E. So a second ago when, we went, when I went back and collected the figures, that was not necessary. It doesn't matter what the figures are. X is still an X. It's going to be just X plus or minus some number. But we don't know what X is. That was number 290. Let's keep on going. 291. Oh, 291 is actually 291 actually is very straightforward. We are told that A plus B plus C is equal to 12, and the question is how much is B? The first statement tells us that A plus B is equal to 8. 
If a plus b is equal to 8, if a plus b is equal to 8, c must be 4. But knowing that c is equal to 4 does not enable us to figure out what b is. a, d, b, c, e. The first statement by itself is not enough. Let's look at the second statement. Second statement tells us that r times... I don't know where the hell r came from. Second statement tells us that b plus c is equal to 6. Again, knowing that b plus 6 is 6, which means a must be 6. Knowing that a is equal to 6 does not tell us what b is, which means second statement by itself does not do any good. It's only when we put them together, then we know we know a, we know c, we can figure out the b. Put it to, to putting them together, we can figure out what c is. But we don't actually have to figure out the value of b. You understand that? We have enough information. That's all it matters. 292. In 292 we are told, or rather we are being asked, is r times w equal to 0? The first statement tells us that r is between negative 6 and 5. r is something between negative 6 and 5, which means it can be any of this value here between negative 6 and 5, which means that if if r happens to be 0, if r happens to be 0, then the answer is yes. The question was, is r times is, is time w 0? Well, it doesn't matter what w is, as long as r is 0, then the answer is yes. But if r is not equal to 0, then the answer is no. r could be anything, which means first statement by itself is not enough. A, D, B, C, E. Let's, let's see what the second statement tells us. Second statement tells us that w is between 6 and 10. w is between 6 and 10. All that tells us is that w, whatever it is, is positive. Since w is positive, the same argument would apply, the same argument that applied in, in statement 1 is going to apply here, so I'm not, going to, I'm not going to rewrite it. The argument is that since w is positive, then if r is 0, then the answer is yes. If r is not 0, answer is no. We don't know what r is. Second statement by itself is not together again. Even if we put them together, we're back to square one. It's the same exact argument. We can't really tell because we don't know. We know w is not zero. We know, we know for a fact that w is not equal to zero, but we don't know if r is equal to zero or not. That was 292. 293. 293 is again another straightforward question. 293, the question is, is x equal to is x equal to 1 over y? That's what we're being asked. The first statement tells us that x times y is 1. Well, if x times y is 1, if we divide both sides by y, we're done. If x times y is 1, if we divide both sides by y, x must equal 1 over y, obviously. This is just silly. The first statement is enough. Let's look at second statement. Second statement tells us that 1 over x times y is equal to 1. Again, if 1 over x, x times y is 1, we want x by itself, bring the x to this side. In other words, in other words, multiply both sides by x. If you multiply both sides of the equation by x, x is going to drop out here. We'll end up with 1 over y is equal to x which is exactly what this is. So, is x, e x equal to 1 over y? The answer is yes. Yes, the answer is b. Which means each statement by itself, each statement by itself is enough to for us to be able to answer the question. The answer is d. 294. 294, the penultimate question. 294 says, that we have a group of 50 people and they all question is how many of them how many of them how many own neither a fax machine nor a printer neither a fax machine nor a printer out of these 50 people let's see what the first statement tells us the first statement tells us the people who own people who own fax or printer or both 
is less than 50. So here I'm using the letter F to represent the people who own fax machine only, or people who own printer only, or people who own both. That quantity is less than 50. Knowing that part does not tell us how many will own neither. All it tells us is that, all it tells us is that because this sum is less than 50, because this sum is less than 50, that tells us that there has to be at least one person, because we have 50 people all together. That tells us there has to be at least one person who owns neither. But it doesn't tell us how many. A, D, B, C, E. Let's look at second statement. Second statement tells us that the people who own both, people who own both, is 15. Again, knowing that 15 people own both a printer and a fax machine does not tell us how many own neither. Second statement by itself is not enough. Now let's put them together. Let's put them together. Why should we put them together? I left no room. Let's, let's, put, let's do it here. Let's put them together. I'm going to show you two different scenarios. Two extreme scenarios, that is. So here is our fax machine. Here is our printer. Here is our fax machine. Here is our printer. Fax. Let's put them inside. Printer. Fax. Printer. And you understand one more time, I'm reminding you, that here, the letter F represents the number of people who own only fax machine. P represents the number of people who own only the printer. And here is B, which is the number of people who own both, and we are told that is 15. We also know the sum of these three is less than 50, which means, uh, which means that 30, at the most, at the most we can have 34 people here, not 35, because 35 plus 15 is 50. So we can have up to 34 people, up to 34 people, people who own only a fax machine or only a printer. Because we have to have at least one here. And we can split it any way you want, makes no difference, make, makes no difference at all. You can do 17, 17, 34, 4, 13, makes no difference. So that's one scenario. In this scenario, there's only one person who owns neither. The question was how many of them own neither? The answer is in this scenario, one. And the possibility is this one. Now the possibility is that there are 15 people who own both, and there is nobody who owns only fax, and there is nobody who owns only printer, and there are 35 people who own neither. There are 35 people who own neither. In this scenario, if anybody does own a fax machine, then they also own printer, and there are 15 such people, and there are 35 people who own neither. As you can see, we can't really tell how many people own neither. The answer to this question is E. The answer to this question is E. We can't really tell. I'm going to take a quick break, even though we're getting to the last question. Number 295. Number 295 is a very silly question. It's a gift. Whenever I say it's a silly question, that's, that's a gift. It's just too simple. The question here is, what, how much is W raised to negative 2? How much is W raised to negative 2? The first statement tells us that W raised to negative 1 is half. Well, if W raised to negative 1 is half, if you want W raised to negative 2, all we have to do is square the two sides. And we have our answer. W raised to negative 2 is 1 quarter. So the first statement by itself is enough. Let's look at second statement. Second statement tells us that w is equal to, or w, w cube is equal to 8. If w cube is equal to 8, that means w must be 2. If we know the value of w, we can figure out w raised to 2. That statement is also enough by itself. So for number 295, the answer is D. For this question, the answer was E. That was number 294. That was the end of that page. We're going to stop right here. Seems like a logical place. We're going to pick up again tomorrow where we meet, when we meet from where we left off. From We're going to pick up from number two, 296 on the next page. In the meantime, if you wish to get hold of me, if you would like to work with me, if you would like to hire me to help you get ready for the exam, all you have to do is send me an email. Go to my website at keshwaniprev.com. From there you can send me an email. You can even fill out a form if you wish to tell me a little bit more about yourself. I will talk some more. All right.
Bueno.